Hi, I'm Lisa Savage. Welcome to Pathways to Progress. This is the show where we discuss municipal politics here in the city of Portland. We've just had a big election, so uh, we have a lot to talk about tonight. I'm here with Councillor Victoria Pelletier at, here at Portland Media Center. Uh, and, and tonight's an exciting milestone because we are live on YouTube as well as our usual live streaming on the Portland Media Center site. So that's uh, exciting. And uh, so we are looking for one of our counselors. Uh, Councilor Roberta Rodriguez is missing in action at the moment, but we think we have located him. Uh, so we'll get started without him. And then, um, you know, hopefully he'll join us before a half hour is up. <laughs> so Councilor Pelletier, quite a week, eh? Again, you <laughs> yeah. had a week. Yeah, we, um, it, we have the election on Tuesday, which it's now Friday, and it feels like so much time has gone by since we voted and found out the results and now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna be really interesting now because we'll have two more meetings with this current council. Mm -hmm. um, one that's coming Monday and then one a week from Monday, so two weeks in a row. And then we'll have the inauguration um, in early December and that will be the changeover for the new council. And so it'll it'll look a little different than I think people are, are expecting and we'll, we'll have a new council body and we'll be welcoming two new, two brand new counselors, um, and then obviously a new mayor. So it will be really And so say their names for me again, uh, the two new so counselors. So the two new counselors, so there is Anna Bullitt, who won for District 4, mm -hmm. and she'll be taking over Andrew Zaro's seat from District 4. And then there is Kate Sykes from District 5, and she'll be taking over where Mark, Mark Dion is now. And Mark Dion, obviously, will be the new Portland mayor. mayor, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So no big... Um, Ranked choice voting surprises there. He was in the lead in the first round, and then by the second round, he had clinched it. So you've obviously worked with Mark Diane for a while now, yeah. so probably not a lot of surprises coming in how he will conduct the business of the city council, but it will be a change. It will definitely be a change. Um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. What I will say is that uh, he and I have come a very long way from where we used to be, so at least there's <laughs> we have a little bit of a, a di more of a dialogue than I think that we used to have when I first started the council. I think mm -hmm. a lot of that was due to meeting in, meeting on Zoom um, mm -hmm. and just not knowing each other, not knowing the council, and not having anything to go off of. So, yeah, I think it'll be different. I, I think naturally with the changeover from Mayor Snyder to now Mayor-elect Dion and then having two new councilors join us and having two new council. I mean, Mark Dion will still be there, but Andrew Zaro will be gone. Um, and I just think that will, you know, the dynamic of all of it will change. And then myself, Councillor Rodriguez and Councillor Trevorrow will be the seniors on the council at that point, which How is does really that crazy. Feel? That feels really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it feels, um, in a way, it feels like uh, a triumph because I remember when we first got elected, like I, it's weird to even have election day and think that two years ago it was ours mm -hmm. um, and we were finding out whether or not we got elected and so much has happened in two years that now thinking about like, oh, we have, we have a year left and that's, this is our third and final year before we would have to run for re-election if we decide to do, do so. Mm -hmm. um, so just thinking of the fact that we have made it to the you know, over the two year mark and we'll be in our last year is, is pretty wild to think about, but. So would I be right in thinking that the council will become a bit more progressive after uh, the change goes into effect? Uh, Councillor Dion will no longer be a uh, voting mm -hmm. councillor. I mean, do they they'll have a tiebreaker? They have a tiebreaker vote, or they well, they'll still get a vote. The mayor okay. still gets mm -hmm. to vote. Okay. Um, so they'll we'll go around, and he'll just be from the mayor's perspective rather than District Five. But the we're nine people, including the mayor, so we get nine votes. So mm -hmm. he'll still be a voting member of the council. Um, and I don't know. It's so it's interesting with the word progressive because people said that about us. Like I remember when I got elected in 2021, mm -hmm. everyone was like, "This is the most progressive council we've ever had," and like, "Oh my gosh!" And I don't know. I still don't feel like we're that progressive. I think a lot of people thought we would be a little bit more. So it's always interesting to hear like this is going to be the most progressive council ever because I we really won't know until we get into the session and until we get into conversations around policy and votes and things like that and things I think ebb and flow with with people too as they're trying to figure out um, you know you feel differently about every issue True. so I will say that I mean the exciting part that I didn't even realize that Councillor Fournier actually told me was that all the district seats now have women as representatives mm -hmm. I think that's the first time in our city's history that that has ever happened and now we have six 
women on the council. So 6-3 majority was women, mm -hmm. which um, is also really cool to be a part of. I think last year was the first time we had an all-women committee for the Health and Human Services Committee. So we'll probably be seeing more of that um, in 2024. Mm -hmm. And then you always have the checks and balances aspect of municipal government, particularly the way Portland's is structured. Mm -hmm. The yes. council could be very progressive, mm -hmm. but there uh, is a quite a limit on whether you can implement your policies uh, mm -hmm. through the existing structure of the city manager and the city department heads. Right, yeah, it's, um, the city manager essentially has full authority over things that we do and um, has, has manages city operations, which is a lot of what we do. So we can create policy, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of things where the city manager can have the final say and doesn't have a vote. It is an appointed position. And I, I know with the charter commission work, we had that, we had lots of conversations around strong mayor model and whether or not that would work for Portland. And ultimately that question did not succeed. Um, so we are still subservient uh, to the city manager in a lot of ways. And I think that even with the mayor position, mm -hmm. it is, um, you know, you are at, at the, you are at the top and you are setting the agenda and you are leading the conversations at times and you are definitely the facilitator. But I think too, even with the mayoral position, I think uh, it's still, um, the Ma Mayor Snyder used to say this a lot, that she still considered herself an at-large counselor, and you are still one of us um, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It um, will be. So question A, uh, failed uh, spectacularly. 70% yeah. of people voted. Yeah. No, we don't want to exempt yeah. any landlords from rent control. Were right. you surprised by that, or that was what you... I was not surprised by that at all. I think it's... Um, I think multiple times now, the, the tenants of Portland have really made their voice very clear at the polls about how they feel about rent control. We are a city of renters. We have the largest demographic, I think, of renters in my district, District 2. So I always love to see those numbers come out of District 2 because it's mm -hmm. pretty, pretty intense no across the board, um, which is great because I, I think that we, we need to let time for, to enjoy rent control. Like I hope that we can actually just enjoy it instead mm -hmm. of always fighting for it, instead mm -hmm. of always having it be under attack. And I think now twice in a row to see um, a question in terms of amending rent control really fail spectacularly at the polls. This happened again, this happened in June and is now happening again in November most recently. So I think the tenants um, have, have spoken and made it very clear that rent control is something that they hope to, to have and to hang on to. And I think it really reflects the priorities of Portland in that way. And really, I think, empowers the, the tenants to make their voices heard as much as they can at the polls. So I was, I was happy, as a renter, I was happy to see that. Yes, I, I know that you represent the renters on, <laughs> on the council. That's People are so tired of me saying that, but I was like, as, the, as one Somebody of the renters. Somebody needs to. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that some cities in the country, uh, such as New York, such as San Francisco, they've had rent control for decades. Mm -hmm. Once it gets in there, renters are very loath to give it up. Mm -hmm. Of course, then landlords start looking for all the loopholes and, right. the, and the workarounds and that sort of thing. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, they, there's a pretty good track record of once you get rent control, it's it's in there. Yeah, and there, there's such a power dynamic. I know that it's, you know, with this most recent referenda item, it was landlords that had nine or fewer units. Right. And I think to those landlords, they are looking at nine or fewer units as like, well, it's just nine. And for us, we're, you know, as mm -hmm. renters, we're like, that's a lot. That's still so much. So I think it's always perspective. And again, like I only have a lens from as a renter, I only have a lens as somebody that is consistently struggling to live in Portland. And so many of my friends and community members are as well. So we're all just clinging on to rent control because it's really one of the only rights that we have as tenants. I mean, we're really at the will um, and at the discretion of the landlords. We are basically asking them, like, can we please live here and can we hopefully afford it and please don't kick us out and please don't evict us. So being able to have rights is really important and I'm hopeful that with these two significant votes, that again, we're overwhelmingly no votes, that hopefully we can just relax a little bit and enjoy having rent control and enjoy having at least a little bit of autonomy over feeling like something has our back if there ever is any type of behavior by landlords where you know, we feel like it's um, 
not in line with with the policies or illegal or whatever so it feels good to just have like a little something to hold on to to say like okay this policy has my back so well i personally thought nine units was kind of a strange number mm -hmm. with property values being what they are yeah someone who owns nine units mm -hmm. in portland that's, that's a, a that's a fairly that's a yeah that's a lot yeah if they had said one or two right they might have you know gotten more support for it yeah like you know some older person that owns a right duplex lives in it and rents the other half kind of thing yeah but nine that's nine cool. is a lot yeah yeah, yeah. so no, i was I, so yeah I was that was a good outcome I was it was happy yeah to see that yep um so uh there's some big items on the agenda coming up mm -hmm. just to clarify for our viewers when the um next council next two council meetings mm -hmm. occur the changeover will not have happened so the mm -hmm. newly elected councillors will not be seated yet uh mayor dion will still be a councillor mm -hmm. not the mayor and yep. so forth so that's something to bear in mind as we move into our discussion about the uh attempt to and that i know you're part of to ban uh sweeping encampments mm -hmm. I, i'm unclear whether i should say during the winter or mm -hmm. should I say at least during the winter? Mm -hmm. Or should I just leave that qualifying phrase off? Yeah, I think the the way that they had it written, and again, it's um, I know has been worked on extensively by Councillor Trevaro and Councillor Rodriguez. So I wish Councillor Rodriguez was <laughs> here to be able to to give more of the the specifics on that. But I I think that the date they said until at least April thirtieth, twenty twenty four, to just have no sweeps in Portland. Mm -hmm. And then I think at that date, it would be, we're revisiting this conversation because um, I think they wanted to have a sunset date in there so mm -hmm. that it wasn't just kind of forever, but I think it was uh, um, looking to be at least through the winter and through some of the spring. Okay, so it would be realistic to mm -hmm. say that. Yep. So our last show, we discussed um, how uh, Councilor Rodriguez had tried to bring um, an emergency uh, piece of, um, legislation is the wrong word, but an emergency, what's the right word, um, you know, a piece mm. to the council to ban encampments. Yeah. But at the very last minute, he and Councilor Trevoro found out that that would have kicked in emergency pay for mm -hmm. every worker in Portland. Right. And that was not their intent. Mm -hmm. And they did not realize that the way they had structured their um, proposal would do that. So now, if I understand it correctly, they kind of backed up and went at it from a different approach, which is amending an existing um, law that's in mm -hmm. place, regulation that's right. in place. Is the regulation about camping? I think it's about camping currently. Okay. Um, yeah. And we, this just got posted on the agenda yesterday, mm -hmm. I think. So mm -hmm. I haven't even had a chance to dive into it. It's, it got posted Thursday. It's not Friday. Um, so I wish I had more of a, a, a chance to really like go through the specifics. But the overall theme in terms of what, what this um, ordinance is, is to just stop all sweeping until the April 30th date. Mm -hmm. And that's correct that they had to amend an existing policy. And I think it was our existing camping um, ordinance that we had. They're mm -hmm. amending that okay. and then just saying we're not sweeping any encampments regardless of, you know, I think size or impact or whatever until we can make it to that April 30th date. And then mm -hmm. they're hoping by then the encampment crisis response team will also be able to do significant work of hopefully placing people into shelters. Okay. I have an email that uh, Councillor Trevoro sent me this week where I had been asking about why, I was asking someone else who then forwarded the question to her. Um, I'll just read it if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Lisa. It's an ordinance amendment. Specifically, it is three amendments to the sections of city code from which the manager derives her authority to enforce the no camping administrative policy. The sections are in chapters 17, 18, and 25. They address loitering, parks and public, spa parks and public spaces. It basically adds a notwithstanding section to each, which allows for camping by unhoused individuals through April 30th. Yeah. So... Um, I know that this is something that people feel really strongly about mm -hmm. in the city of Portland. Yeah, definitely. Of course, we should note that it will not stop the state of Maine Correct. from doing encampment sweeps. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm not mistaken, the last or one of the last yeah, couple encampment sweeps on Marginal Way yeah. was uh, 
the state, state yep. the Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. I saw a post on social media shortly after saying, oh, it's so great that they did that encampment sweep so they could go back to having an empty parking lot. And it was a picture of the March oh, yeah. parking lot with like no cars well, in there. nothing there. Yep. Yep. But of course, the objections that lead to sweeps are not no one can park their cars there. It's mm -hmm. the b nearby businesses yes. objecting to all sorts of things mm -hmm. that they experience um, because of the proximity of yeah. encampment. Yeah. So we've seen that time and again as well. Mm -hmm. So Monday night, you'll be having the first reading Correct. of this amendment. Yep. I saw uh, the Party of Socialism and Liberation is uh, asking people to come uh, do a candlelight vigil outside City Hall while you're uh, mm -hmm. having the first reading. Yes. Um, in support of it. Um, you don't take Zoom public comments anymore, do Not you? Not anymore. <laughs> no. So people got to People have to come get dressed, into the meeting. Get out of their sweatpants and go down there yeah. and show up if they want to say something. Yes. Yeah, I think we will. So we'll have, um, it's a first read, so there'll be no action on Monday. People, I believe, will still be able to come in and give public comment on non-agenda items. It's on the agenda as a first read. Um, but people should be still able to come in if they want to speak on the item because we're not doing any action on that. And mm -hmm. then on the, the meeting on November 20th will be the, the vote. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we're, we're already getting a significant amount of feedback. I think that this is probably the biggest conversation that we're having in Portland that we've been having for a very long time. So this topic will draw out a, a ton of people. And that's just based on, you know, again, the agenda for Monday's meeting was posted yesterday. And I think there was a news article posted about this yesterday. And even in the past 24 hours, we have gotten hundreds of emails at mm. this point from people with their feedback mm -hmm. um, about how they feel about this ordinance or this amendment, whether to do it or whether to not do it. And it's definitely one of those votes where it's going to be very emotional. And regardless of the decision, we're going to... A lot oh, of people will be unhappy. A lot of people will be unhappy. <laughs> no matter how it goes. No matter how it goes. Right. Um, so it will, it will absolutely be, if I had to predict, especially because the vote will be the 20th, and that will be our last meeting before the new councilors come in, I, I predict that City Hall will be very full with public comment from people who mm -hmm. want to um, share. And yeah, I think we'll see what happens. If I had to predict it now, I really have no idea if it will pass or not. I think it will be a 5-4 again. You do? I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think... Either way, I'm not sure, but I think it'll be very close. And that's just based on the history of some of our votes around this and mm -hmm. around, um, for example, the adding 50 beds to the HSC was a 5-4 vote and then it was a 4-4 vote because one of the counselors was absent. So all of our votes in this way have been really close mm -hmm. and um, I predict it will happen like that again. So one criticism that I heard voiced was, oh yeah, sure, they would do this and wait until after the election to take this up but uh, as you pointed out, well, the uh, council is likely to get a little bit more progressive after the changeover. So yeah. actually, it, it doesn't really matter that the election happened. Mm -hmm. The new councilors have not been seated yet. Yeah, and I do know because uh, Councilor Rodriguez talked about this at our at last month's Pathways to Progress. This was already supposed to be on the agenda for one of our earlier meetings prior to the election. Mm -hmm. But because there was so much back and forth, I think, with the councilors and with city staff and a lot of issues of putting it on the agenda, it got extremely delayed. So this actually wasn't, I don't think, a strategic move to wait until after the election because I was looking for it on the meeting that we had in October. I thought that that was actually going to be something we were voting on just based on what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. So it just happened to fall, I think, where the next meeting that they could get it on the agenda because I, people need to also remember that we amended our schedule based on the election. So that's why we have two meetings in a row. Mm -hmm. So we haven't met since October 16th, I think was our last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of the election, we have a shift in schedule and this is the next closest meeting that we could put this, um, that they could put this on the agenda. So, you know, and I think too with, this happened when, when we were elected in 2021, we had our first big vote actually on the inauguration, which was the shelter licensing vote. Mm -hmm. um, that was like a four hour conversation around and around. And that one actually did get pushed so that the new counselors could vote on it. Cause mm -hmm. I specifically remember not thinking we would vote on that and then mm -hmm. seeing that it got um, delayed. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know the specifics in terms of, um, you know, what Councillor Trevorrow and what Councillor Rodriguez have been 
talking about or working with city staff on, but I do know that getting things on the agenda is not always as easy as people maybe think that it is. So, um, yeah. Sure, there's a lot of moving pieces yeah. and parts that have to fall into place before it can, yeah. can really happen. It's an interesting uh, issue because uh, the Portland voters are very split on it. Mm -hmm. you know? Yep. People feel very, very strongly. And also it's a seasonal issue saying, oh, you know, sure, they would wait until, well, we're talking about mm -hmm. the cold. It right. is Maine. We're not in San Diego. Right. So a decision about uh, not evicting people from what little home they have mm -hmm. in a tent in a community um, is, uh, you know, becomes a lot more uh, urgent, mm -hmm. whether it's October or November or December. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I saw That's part of it too. I saw a quote from Councilor Rodriguez actually in the article today that he said that even if the shelters were at 100% capacity, we would still have hundreds of people outside. Because I think what we're hearing is like we don't need to do this; we need to get people into shelter, which has been actively something that the encampment crisis response team has been working on um, since their inception. Since mm. I don't know, it was probably. January, February, when we really started having these conversations about creating this task force. So I feel like with this conversation specifically, which I do know draws out a ton of people with different perspectives, the one thing I think we can all agree on is that sweeping encampments hasn't been working. Regardless if you are pro sweep or whatever, what we've been seeing is that we are sweeping encampments and then an encampment is created elsewhere that's even larger than the previous one. Mm -hmm. Because when we sweep encampments, then we designate that location as a, a place where there's no camping allowed. And so I think that this has been said multiple times, we're funneling people into specific areas of the city based on the fact that we continue to sweep. So right now, the significant growing of encampments that we um, are seeing is in the Harborview Park area, mm -hmm. which is my mm -hmm. district, which mm -hmm. is district two. And we've had three, I think, encampment sweeps, and it really has not alleviated the problem. So I, I know that you know people are, are feeling frustrated by the fact that we have encampments you know all over the city but sweeping them isn't resolving anything and so i, I think that you know in thinking about what do we want to do how do we want to make sure that the providers can actually work with people that are in the encampments and that they're not getting lost by being swept how do we want to you know what can we do to make sure that through the winter time people that are unhoused at least have the resources that belong to them and mm -hmm. aren't losing their belongings um, and losing the place that they go to every single day or night to, to call their space. I don't think anyone wants to be outside when it is negative 20 degrees. But again, even at, at full capacity of our shelters, hundreds of people will still not have a place to go. So what we're hoping is that in the meantime, we're not also saying, well, you can't be here, so we're just sweeping your encampment. Mm -hmm. And then again, it's we're, you know, this is a fairly small city, so we're sweeping a lot of areas and then calling them emphasis areas and I really don't know what's going to happen. I know right now the encampment crisis response team is working on Harborview but if this ordinance doesn't pass and let's say Harborview gets swept and is now designated an emphasis area, what's, left? what's the next spot? And it's just not working. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we'll end up with is a city filled with emphasis areas with no room for camping mm -hmm. and then we are naturally going to have issues where people are going to just pick locations that they feel that they can camp whether they're emphasis areas or not and it, with that i think is going to cause a lot more explain to me issues. how the emphasis areas process came into being so once there's a suite mm -hmm. they, there can never be an encampment there again mm -mm. where's the what ordinance uh, designated that how did i that think happen? it's through it's through some of the work with the encampment crisis response team and just the current ordinance that we have because mm -hmm. basically they're saying this encampment has grown to be a public health hazard and so we're sweeping it and then this is now like stamped as a location where we can no longer have camping in this spot so marginal away and the area of trader joe's now um, are emphasis areas Again, like if we sweep Harborview Park, emphasis area, if we sweep Daring Oaks, emphasis area, Eastern, all of that, mm -hmm. I, I just am like, what's, where are people supposed to go? And I think that that's been the question that we have been going back and forth on since this conversation really took off at the beginning of the year. And I think, you know, we're waiting on this shelter to hopefully open up in Riverside, which is a 180 bed shelter that we're hoping some of the asylum seekers can go into that shelter. It will free up some space in the HSC as well. Um, but it's just gonna take significant time and significant dedication and a lot of patience from people. And, you know, I, I think 
again, it's an emotional conversation and I totally get it. We're all coming at it from different perspectives, but I would hope that even the pro sweep people can understand that this, the sweeping is not working. So I just am kind of like. Well, it's working as a punishment. Yeah, exactly. And it's working yeah. as a, okay, you're never having an encampment here again. I right. mean, the logic of, well, it was a public health hazard because mm -hmm. there were too many people and no sanitary facilities were not inadequate. Yeah. Uh, but once it's empty again, mm -hmm. um, yeah. What is that? You know, so, so why yeah. is it a public health hazard now if an yeah. a small encampment or yeah. an encampment with uh, toilets and showers or right. whatever? Right. Yeah. I don't How know. are you feeling about the 50 bed? Uh, the, the the vote to not add oh. the 50 beds. Do you do you regret your stand? Have you? Are you still you still feel as strongly about it, or have you kind of? Um, no, I feel the same, and this is so wild that it'll be the third time that we have this conversation because we didn't table it indefinitely at the last meeting, so it'll come back up for a conversation mm -hmm. on Monday. Um, I, it's that, that, it's not an easy vote to make, and I really try to look at that from every angle, but realistically, the shelters and the numbers that we were receiving were showing that that shelter wasn't at full capacity even remotely. Mm -hmm. So adding 50 beds to me didn't feel like it was a, like a viable solution of actually solving the problem that we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be one thing if we weren't already working on opening another shelter in Riverside that hopefully will be able to house unhoused asylum seekers. And at that point, maybe we can focus more on the HSC. But I'm also just We've, we've heard direct feedback from individuals that are unhoused that they do not want to go to the HSC based on the amount of barriers that exist, mm -hmm. based on the fact that you can't go in with a partner if you want to be able to sleep with a partner. You can't do that because they're separated by gender. You can't bring in a pet. So if you have, you know, like a comfort that you want to have in, you mm -hmm. can't really have that in there. There are a significant amount of of barriers to going in there. And I think if we're not resolving that, like I don't wanna add 50 beds to a place that a lot of people don't wanna go. Well, it and was also designed to have enough space yeah. and to be the kind of shelter where people could feel more secure right. and have a little autonomy mm -hmm. and have their own dedicated, you know, it was designed yeah. that way, was yeah. it not? Right. So right. to immediately break that doesn't make a lot of sense. Either. Yeah. I think the people that think that shelter is a solution to the encampments have never been unhoused. No have never been in, spent the night in a shelter mm -hmm. and they kind of honestly don't really know what they're talking about. Yeah, um, it's, it's, I think it's really complex because I know a lot of people were like, why didn't you add the 50 beds? Like if we add 50 beds, then magically people are gonna wanna go in. But people, if they don't wanna go in, if we have individuals saying there's no way I'm going into that shelter, that's I think the problem that we need to be resolving mm -hmm. and not just being like, well, we added 50 beds and you don't want them. So because you know, or or we have a shelter that you're not utilizing, so your punishment is we're just going to sweep. We offered you a parachute, and you're arguing yeah. what color it is. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think that we I think we we have the capability of being better than this and being able to really fix the systemic um, issues that we're seeing. And again, like I say this every time, people hate it, but our goal was racial equity, and I put this under the umbrella in terms of of racial racial and social equity of making sure that we are looking at the actual root of the problem and not just all of the the stuff on top of saying like, well, I don't like seeing encampments in my neighborhood, so get rid of them. Mm -hmm. But there's just the sweeping, as we've seen, it's not working. And again, I don't know where everybody is supposed to go. These are individuals, these are humans, these are our community, they're in our community. And I think by just going sweep, 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 we're actually not solving anything And if any, other than re-traumatizing an already traumatized um, demographic of individuals and continuing to not come up with any type of solution. I think the encampment crisis response team is great, and I'm really hopeful that in pausing encampment sweeps that they can actually stay with the context that they have and really try to also address the barriers at HSC and at the same time focus on the opening of this new shelter. And all of these things, I think, working in tandem, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get somewhere. So we're almost out of time. I believe that you would like to encourage people who want a ban on encampment sweeps, certainly during the winter, to come to Monday night's meeting and give public testimony. You can't do it on Zoom anymore. You have to show do up. It on Zoom. But uh, the city councilors can really use uh, your support. They're hearing many, many loud voices saying, we want sweeps to continue. And so if you are one of the people that does not want sweeps to continue, it's time to speak up and be there. Um, we're out of time. Uh, thanks for being with me tonight, Councillor Pilleter. Always a pleasure. Our next show will be in December on Friday the 8th at 7 p.m. 
I want to thank the Portland Media Center and our great tech crew for uh, making this possible. Thank you so much, our audience listening in from home. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. And um, so please, you know, get involved in your city government and try to support uh, your elected officials to do the things that you would like to see them do because they can't do it without you, really. You might think they can, but they really <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> need your support. So thanks for being with us this evening.